Hello, everyone. Um, so this is the year of the camel, and uh, Ilse here has worked 30 years with the Raika tribe, who are native to Rajasthan. And her, this morning, I was speaking with Vasamalli, who is part of the indigenous community of Toda. And she was telling quite movingly that uh, Ilse has not just worked with the Raika, but pastoralists across India and has facilitated uh, their voice being staged and platformed in, in a lot of you know, big ways. And, and she was speaking with such gratitude for her. And Ilse's work sort of spans very vastly. She started with archaeozoology um, and then veterinary medicine, conservation, advocacy. She runs a company called Camel Charisma. She's written books, and among them is Camel Karma, which is specifically about uh, pastoralists, uh, the Raika pastoralists in Rajasthan, and then Hoof Prints on the Land, which is pastoralists across India. And Ilse, can you share your journey with us? Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you very much for that introduction. I think before I start talking, we should start... Uh, we have a few pictures just to give you a visual impression of uh, what we're talking about and what is so important about Rajasthan. Yes, it is the International Year of Camelids, and people are asking me, what does that mean, the International Year? Is it something official? And uh, it actually is something very official because the United Nations General Assembly has a system where they allot certain neglected subjects uh, to a year in order for it to generate extra attention and awareness. So most of you will know that last year was the International Year of Millets. So this year, it's the International Year of Camelids. Now, it's not camels. I'm talking of camelids. And camelids actually um, encompasses also the South American uh, relatives of the camels and it also encompasses the two humpbackian camel. And the suggestion to have an international year on camelids actually came from Bolivia, where um, llamas and alpacas are really important culturally. So after a country has applied for uh, making an international year, then the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, they look into this and they try to find some justification. And in this case, they came up with a lot of justifications and said that the great potential by, of camelids is to contribute to the fight against hunger, to tackle extreme poverty. Women are really important in the management of camelids and also camelids make a contribution to the sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, and they can combat desertification and reverse land degradation and stem the loss of biological diversity. So there are plenty of reasons why there should be an international year of camelids. And this uh, map gives you just a little impression of the camelid cultures of the world. So we have in South America, in the Andes, we have the, uh, the llamas, alpacas, vicuñas, and guanacos. We have the one hump dromedary camel from uh, basically from Mauritania in the west until India in the east. And we have the two hump back dream camel up there in the cold deserts in Central Asia, in Mongolia, uh, and in China. And Rajasthan is home to the amazing Raika camel culture. And it truly is amazing because the Raika. They believed they were made by God Shiva to take care of the camel, so they traditionally felt really responsible for the welfare of the camel. And that's what initially attracted me to, to work here in Rajasthan, and I think that's what hasn't let me go until now. And so the, the people, the Raika we work with, they're all really uh, excited about the International Year of Camelids. And we've already had a few. We had an international workshop of camel pastoralists earlier this month. We're going to have another function, workshop on camel well-being during the Nagoa uh, Livestock Fair. And yeah, 
And I want to say a few words about the ecology of the camels. So camels, they eat these really hardy, thorny, salty, extremely drought-resistant desert plants. And the tar desert is different from other deserts because it has a lot of trees. You don't find that in, in most uh, other deserts. And the camels just are totally symbiotic with these trees. They actually propagate these trees, the seeds in their manure, and where camels have grazed, forest comes up. I call them desert gardeners. And according to traditional knowledge, camels forage on 36 species, and 36 is kind of a magic number because they actually uh, eat a lot more species. But all these species are known for their therapeutic qualities, and they're all mentioned in the Ayurveda. So this gives you an indication of how important the milk of the camel is. The milk of the camel is truly the gift of the desert because it distills all the goodness of these desert plants into the milk. And I also would like to say, state that pastoralism, keeping grazing animals, it's the most ecological way of food production because it doesn't need fossil fuels. It's powered only by solar energy, by biodiversity, and by that really close human-animal relationship, which is at the core of it. Without that closeness between people and animals, it doesn't work. So it's a way of producing food without fertilizers, without chemicals, without fossil fuels. It's just absolutely fantastic. And camel milk, yeah, I have to say a few words about camel milk. So it's naturally low fat, it's good for lactose intolerant people, it's high in vitamin C and very high in iron, preventing anemia and stunting, and I think that's important for the rural areas. It also, for the people who live in cities, it alleviates diabetes and autism, which are major problems. It strengthens the immune system, and since COVID, the consumer interest really has increased. Uh, and the Rajasthan camel milk, also because of the, the diet of the camels, I mean, we've made it a little bit famous in the world, and it's been included in the arc of taste of the Slow Food Foundation for Biodiversity in Italy. And uh, we are promoting it as Rajasthan's USP, as a culinary delicacy. We had the Godwa Camel Cheese Festival last year, and the cheeses are now in demand by top hotels like the Umayyad Bhavan and the Lake Palace. And, but what we are really concerned about is that we're trying to con promote the concept of cruelty-free camel milk. A lot of people don't want to drink any animal milk ma anymore. They want to go for plant milks because they think it's cruel to use animals for that purpose. But actually, the Raika, they do, it's not cruel at all, I would say, because we always make sure that the calf is not separated from its mother. Uh, we make sure that the camels are kept in a nomadic system where they can move around and they can choose their own diets. They can decide, I'm going to eat from that tree or I'm going to go over there. So they're not like stall fed like in the industrial systems. Plus there's that very close um, relationship with humans which is important for us and this Raika Herder her here, his name is Maduram, and he was actually adopted by a camel as her son. And if he goes somewhere and she can't see him, she gets really upset. You know, she runs after him. She won't go with the rest of the herd unless her, um, her child is uh, with her. So, but camel milk is not only for people who can pay a lot of money. Uh, or who want to enjoy a delicacy, it's also very important as medicine, and it works wonders for TB, people with TB. The man on the left here, he had been given up by doctors, he had tuberculosis. We provided him camel milk over several months, now he's back to work. He drives a tractor and, and can work as a farmer again. Before that, he was so weak that his mother had to spoon feed him. So camel milk really makes a difference, and it's not just anecdotal. We also know that in Central Asian countries, camel milk is used systematically for therapeutic purposes. They are sanatoria where people only drink camel milk for months, yeah. 
And it's also an important source for tribal children who don't get access to a lot of protein. And we have a program there where we uh, provide milk to um, Adivasi children every morning when they go to school. Um, so what I'm just trying to get across is that the Raika camel culture, it's, it's really unique. And we have to do everything to save it. But unfortunately, the situation for camels is very dire in the state, even though it is state animal. But we really, it's a treasure. Uh, I mean, Rajasthan should not only be known for tigers, it must be known, become known for its camel culture. I think what's really special is that you've not just written books, but you've made real lasting change for communities, animals, ecologies, and, 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 and that's rare, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm deeply interested in unpacking this reality. That is, um, you know, our ecosystems, even forests and grasslands, have evolved with herding communities, pastoral communities. We know that the vulture, uh, all the species of vultures evolved exactly when human beings started herding. And they are almost entirely dependent on, you know, the deaths of uh, cattle. Um, and, and, and as uh, herding communities go, we also see vulture decline. Or as herding communities start using certain kinds of medicine on the animals, there's vulture decline. So there's such a great correlation. And I wanted to ask you how you've seen this to be true. How have... Uh, for instance, the ecosystems of Rajasthan evolved around herding communities and how do herding communities uh, steward the larger ecosystem? Um, you know, we have actually, we have very little historical data of what happened in Rajasthan or I haven't been able to find much. But I know that in Europe, pastoralism or the revival of pastoralism is seen as a key tool for conserving biodiversity. And you mentioned the vulture. And Spain, for instance, is a country where transhumans, meaning seasonal movements of um, sheep mostly, have been extremely important historically. And uh, the country is crisscrossed by official paths for, for sheep movements. And when that movement came to a halt because sheep were being transported by railway at the beginning of the 20th century, this also led to a decline of, of biodiversity. And now this transhuman system has been revived and with it also the vulture population has come back. And the vulture and other birds uh, are following those moving uh, sheep herds. And um, so actually in Germany, uh, Grazing animals is the most frequently used uh, way of nature uh, conservation. The shepherds in Germany get most of their income from doing uh, environmental services. I'm very interested in, and I'm quite taken by your personal journey of, 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 a, of a very unusual choice of career and your, your striving to uh, in the path of falling in love with camels and, and herding communities. Can you speak about that a bit? Yeah, well, I grew up with animals, with horses and dogs, and I loved animals. And so I thought I'll become a veterinary doctor because then I can help uh, animals. So I went uh, through the veterinary course. I got my degree in Hanover in Germany. And then once I was graduated and started to work, I realized it did not really uh, align with me. Because either you were, you know, you worked with farm animals, and farm animals, they are, they were just beginning to be treated as machines. You know, machines just to produce milk and meat most efficiently. Like they were not regarded as 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 living beings almost. I mean, I'm exaggerating. A lot of farmers they do love their animals, but but this was a general trend. So I couldn't really. I had. A, most of what I did was artificial inseminating of cows, and I don't know, it just didn't gel with me. And then the other option was small animals, and I also, if you treat small animals, it's mostly you have to treat the owner, you know, because the owner, 
they often imagine something is wrong with their pet. So even if nothing is wrong with the pet, you have to give an injection, I mean, to satisfy the owner. So I was also not good at that uh, kind of handling people at that stage in my life. So I looked for an alternative. And um, I ended up uh, working with archaeologists as an archaeozoologist, identifying the animal bones that are found on uh, archaeological sites. You know, if you interpret them, you can make conclusions about past economies and ecologies. And um, so I did that in Jordan. And I was also working on this beautiful archaeological site in the Jordan Valley. And there was this camel herd passing by. You know, there was a Bedouin, he was singing to them. And there was such harmony, you know, between people and animals, again. And so, so that attracted me. And then I started reading about camels, and I found out how important they are for food security and um, for desert ecology. So I did my PhD on camel domestication. And um, after a while, again, I, I was tired of working with bones of dead animals. I wanted to work with live camels. And I came to India on a fellowship. And that's been it. Now, that was in 1990, 91. I came as a, a grantee of the American <laughs> Institute of Indian Studies. Yeah. That, that's, that's the story actually Ilse tells in her book, Camel Karma, and uh, what she has done ever since, and all the uh, various challenges and uh, fascinations she has uh, navigated. Um, you mentioned uh, farming animals. Yeah. And today we have industrial farming. Um, as one of the key contributors to ecological crisis, climate crisis, you know, all, all the rest of that. And very strangely, the same practice, but with a culture of bonding and tradition and uh, uh, harmony with one's local ecology seems to create the opposite effect. Although there are maybe parts in India where it's not done well and there's issues of overgrazing. But then there are so many examples like you've given where <laughs> There's such a stark difference between industrial farming and pastoralism, and, and how does that come about? How well, I mean, the, the industrial uh, animal farming, I think it started in the United States in the early uh, 20th centuries, and it, it really is just about feed and feed efficiency. You know, how much uh, feed do I give to my animal, and how much fat uh, does it put on, or how much meat, and how much milk does it give? Everything is reduced to that efficiency paradigm. So you, you, know, you put all these thousands of animals in one place, which, and you feed them. You bring the feed from outside. And um, it causes so many problems in terms of animal welfare, that confinement. Then it predi predisposes the animals to diseases, being confined so closely. Uh, it causes ecological damage, because these animals are fed with uh, you know, genetically modified maize, genetically modified corn, uh, um, soybeans. And, uh, but the system, by animal scientists, they say this is efficient. And they don't look at all the, you know, the animal welfare and the ecological and the pollution um, uh, side effects. Because they see the animal out of its context. And the pastures, they raise animals as part of the landscape. You, know, you can see them moving around. And the animals actually only you know, eat what is available anyway. It's not especially grown for them. It is either it's wild uh, vegetation or it's crop aftermath. So there's no expense involved in, in growing feed for them. Also, the animals have to walk, which keeps them healthy. They're in like in a natural social system in a herd. So, so it's, it's, um, it's a totally different approach. I mean, they have nothing to do with each other. And India is so fortunate because you know, from the Himalayas to Kanyakumari, it is full of these pastoralist cultures. You know, whether they keep yaks uh, in the Himalayas or the Toda buffalo in the south or um, uh, pigs in Odisha or camels in Rajasthan and in Gujarat, uh, it's full of them. And actually, they, they provide so much, 60%, I mean, according to rough calculations, 60% of the um, milk, no, uh, and 70% of the meat or something like that is produced in these pastoral systems. So they make an enormous contribution to India's economy. 
And, but the most important product that they have is actually not meat or milk, it is the manure, which is so important uh, for maintaining India's soil fertility. Because a lot of Indian soils, they do not um, do well with chemical fertilizers. They become salty and, and they lose their fertility. And the manure, the organic manure, is absolutely essential for India's future food security. But unfortunately, animal scientists, you know, they don't see the manure part. You know, they just see, they just, oh, our Indian cows only give five liters of milk, and in Europe they give 40. Like, you know, they have a complex. Uh, and they shouldn't, because this system, the Indian, the traditional Indian system is in line with nature. It has all the benefits, and we have to do, I was talking about the camel, we have to keep the camel in Rajasthan, but India-wide, we also have to um, keep these pastoral systems alive, and we have to make provisions for them in terms of policies, because everywhere fences are being built, it's very difficult for them to move, and they don't get the respect they deserve. I wonder... I wonder if we can talk about the challenges pastoral, uh, pastoralism is facing. I, I, I happen to very briefly first and sort of uh, be part of advocating for, you know, two of them, you know, one Gujars and who, who are facing difficulty because of Rajaji National Park, of yeah, yeah. state conserve, mm -hmm. but as such their presence in forests is beneficial is what, uh, there's a lot of proof for that. But, uh, but you've been coming upon that time and again and yeah, how yeah. does, yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, it's, it's kind of a leftover from colonial times where the British classified, you know, people who were moving around, they classified many of them as criminal tribes. They tried to make, settle them down uh, so that they could extract taxes from them. And we need, uh, you know, and this is still there. I mean, the, the colonial impact, not just in India, but also in Kenya, wherever the British were, is tremendous and has... Uh, you know, the whole agricultural systems in the world, I mean, the academic agriculture, they're built on that vision or image you have in temperate Europe. You know, you have, a, you have your fields and you have a few cows there in your stable, like, you know, this tidy kind of system which you can afford in a temperate climate, but you can't afford it in, in an Indian or uh, climate. So, uh, where were we? Um, so, yes, and, and then there's that this um, antagonist, so the forest department thinks it has to protect uh, the forest from the animals. And of course the forest should be, I'm glad the forest department is there and that some places are mapped out as under control of the forest department. But I think we also have to change with the times, you know, and realize that pastors, like they do in other, are appreciated for their services in nature conservation. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, you take Nagarhole National Park, the Jenukuruba indigenous people were thrown out, although they've been living with tigers for a very long time, or uh, the Idu Mishmi, or, or there are a lot of examples of that. For, yes, um, yes, it, it is. Yeah, Actually, when yeah. I worked with Vasamali you know, in, uh, in the early 2000s, yeah, exactly, I mean, all the pastors had problems with the forest department, yeah. uh, including the Toda, because the forest department is putting these monocultures in there of, um, I don't know, eucalyptus, I think, and uh, which are not useful as, as uh, animal feed. And we are also very concerned in where I work, uh, below the Kumbhagat Fort, there's the Kumbhagat Wildlife Sanctuary, which is important for, um, I mean, there's leopards there, there's wolves there, there's hyenas there, there's jackals. Um, and now it's their plans to turn it into a tiger reserve, and um, and that would be, you know, at the expense of the existing wildlife, and also at the expense of the pastoralists, because you know, once you have ti the tigers need to be introduced; they're not there at the moment. Then, uh, I mean, tigers are a different ball game than uh, wolves, for instance. With wolves, you wolves have a synergy with pastoralists. Actually, the on the Deccan Plateau, there's some pastoralists, uh, the Kuruba, they worship the wolf because they say the wolf keeps our, uh, um, herds our flocks healthy because they eliminate the sick animals. Yeah. What about other threats like, for instance, developmental projects or, or you know, roads or, you know, industries? What other kinds of threats are Rajasthan's camels? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's lack of land and it's, uh, it's, it's roads. You know, where people earlier used to migrate with the animals, now there's a four-lane uh, highway and that leads to 
uh, terrible uh, accidents, you know, where trucks drive into sheep, flocks of sheep and, and lots of them get killed. So, but, but at the root of it is the fact that these people don't get respected, you know, that nobody realizes their real economic importance. So we have to change the thinking. We need a new paradigm of animal science that doesn't just look at efficiency, but looks at all the externalities as well. Uh, uh, I'd be really curious to know what, what you're doing now. You know, you've been trying to facilitate this and you've, you've had measures of success. W what are you doing now? And, uh, so, uh, yeah. you know, at the moment we're trying to take advantage of the International Year of Camelids. So we are, you know, we are having a series of events around that. And uh, we want to put, again, you know, if you look at, there are lots of camel lovers in the world. But they all want to go that, you know, they want to make camel milk available to everybody. And they also, they're going unthinkingly towards that industrial path. Right? Because they also think, oh, our camels need to give more milk and this and that. So we are trying to promote a development paradigm where the well-being of the camel is in the center. And where it's not about maximizing the milk yields, but it's about maximizing or optimizing both the camel, the livelihoods, and the environment. Any questions for Elsie, please? Yeah. Yes, uh, the lady with the hat. Yeah. Hello. Hello. How are, what are the Reiki, Reiki, Reiki people doing now to supplement their, their way of life, their income, now that the camel business is sort of falling down? So, what, what are the Raika doing now to supplement their business, given that there's a decline in yes. camel herd? Yes, yes, oh. exactly. So, it's actually only a small minority of Raika who are still keeping uh, camel. I mean, there are a few more who keep sheep because sheep are uh, uh, fairly profitable, but camels are not. So, the people, most Raika, for them, the camel herds have become a burden. I mean, they have to look after these animals and they don't get anything back from them, no income. And then what happens? They get so-called, they, they let the camels go, they get smuggled out of Rajasthan, and then they are being brought, then they are confiscated somewhere in Maharashtra, and then they're brought back here and they are brought to this camel sanctuary. And I'm sorry to say that they don't, most of them do not survive because they can't be kept in confinement. They need to go out and graze. So without the Raika, we cannot conserve the camel because camels, are, you can't just, you know, keep them as pets or put a lot of them together like in a zoo. Yeah. Uh, you had a Jimmy. question. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for a very interesting um, um, conversation, uh, discussion about camels. My question was, uh, is there anything that the World uh, Food Program or the FAO or any of the UN uh, agencies, uh, are they doing anything to promote um, a continuation of this particular way of life among the young? Are there any training programs so that the youth don't migrate to the cities or to urban um, forms FAO? of employment? So, so the next generation of Raikas, yeah. what kind of programs uh, you know, uh, are there to sort of continue the culture? Rather than the, uh, yeah. you, you know, the, actually, a lot of young Raika, most of them, they work somewhere in the city in a sweet shop or in a Kapraka Dukan or so. And, um, but they come back home and then they post uh, these videos of, you know, of their father herding camels. And like, you can feel that they are, they're proud of it. And uh, they would be interested if, if they can make a, a reasonable, decent income, they will come back. Actually, a lot of them did come back uh, during COVID because uh, herding wasn't affected really by, by COVID. So uh, it's a question of creating financial incentives for them to, to do this work. Plus, we also have to uh, be sure that there is grazing areas for the camels. So those, it rests on those two things. And that's why we're putting an, an effort into developing products from, uh, from camel milk, making the cheese and, and so on. But we're like very small. Uh, it needs bigger support in order to really make an impact. Uh, Ilse has her own space and farm where she does this too. So, yeah. I, we had a I know Elsie and I've visited her. Yeah. 
be visited with my veterinary doctor. Actually, we run a hospital for camels here, uh, which is 13 years old in March. And uh, we've been also struggling with trying to confiscate, you know, with various people around the country where they send us all their camels, which are confiscated when they're being smuggled out of Rajasthan to Bangladesh and through Bihar and stuff. And there are many people who are trying to save these animals, but the poor camel owners so Elsa, if somewhere we can collaborate because we're also planning to do something for the camelids this year for a week. Yeah. And we visited and I think I would like, uh, you know, our, our veterinary doctor has been doing amazing work with camels and the challenges and we give free treatment and go to neighboring villages right up to Basi and around Jaipur to give free treatment, education and medicines to the camels. Would you like to say something? Uh, we, we, we have a bit of uh, time crunch, so if there are questions, we, you can ask them. Otherwise, I, I'm, I'm sure this would be a wonderful collaboration. All right, thank you. Thank session. you very yeah. much. Sure, yeah. But well, is yeah, there, yeah. sorry, one thing, is there anything we can ask the government? Because camel is the uh, state animal of Rajasthan to help. What did, what, whether that helped? Uh, what, uh, what can we ask of the government? So, I mean, the government has to, you know, it put in place that um, this prohibition of camel export, uh, out, um, export out of Rajasthan. So currently it's illegal to take camels out of Rajasthan. And that made things a lot worse because previously, you know, there's a, there was a market for, for male camels in, I mean, as work animals. There's also a market for camels uh, abroad. Uh, in, in other countries. For instance, I've been told that they would do well in beauty contests in Saudi Arabia, and we get um, contacted by you know, people from the Emirates and, and Saudi Arabia, and they, they are interested in buying camels, and we, we, we have to say, you know, sorry, we can't help. Uh, it's not legal. So, so that really has to be changed. I mean, it's like it's a false belief to think that, you know, by trying to keep them all in Rajasthan, we're going to save them. No, we're not. You, you had a question. Yeah. Yeah. You then. Yeah. Yeah. Isma, we had a very enlightening talk about the camels. My one doubt is, see, like when it's a sheep or a goat or buffaloes or cows, they adapt to any climate throughout India. You said there were a lot of pastures across India. But uh, aren't the uh, camels, you know, bound by climate? Do you think the climate will be, uh, you know, helpful for the camel to come outside uh, Rajasthan? Is it possible? How do you actually practically, can you increase the population of camels? <sighs> when I think they adapt to more of a desert uh, climate, is it possible? No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Camels do not do well in humidity. They get all kinds of diseases. So that's why they are actually mostly restricted to Rajasthan and Gujarat. And if you take them further east, they, they do not thrive. I mean, it's kind of an ecological boundary here in uh, the Aravali Hills, more or less. East of that, the camels are not, are not doing well at all. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, please. Uh, <clears throat> my question is related to ma'am's earlier question. Like last year, UN had declared year of millets, and I, I am aware that there was considerable funding available to promote millets through various food, food festivals and other things, and UN agencies were working on that. So now this year, if they have declared as year of camlets, is there any specific UN agency which works to promote this? And yeah, I mean, there, there's the Food and Agriculture Organizations of the United Nations in Rome, and they, uh, they inaugurated the International Year of Camelids uh, in, I think, uh, end of, in December at some time. But, and I'm on the steering committee, the external steering committee, but they have no, the latest I've heard, they had no funding. They had applied for a larger sum, and they're hoping it's going to come from Saudi Arabia, but it hasn't been approved yet. Uh, so, well, I don't know, we've given up a little bit of hope of money coming from there. Now, with regards to millets, I think the millet, International Year of Millets, was initiated by India. So, I'm sure the Indian government also, uh, you know, uh, supported that financially. So, it's a different situation. I haven't heard in India anybody, you know, any financial resources for the, for the camelids. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, Ilse, uh, less about the camels, more about you. 
When you came to this country all those years ago, can you just talk about the challenges you faced with, with the, you know, the pastoralists in gaining their trust? What the challenges? So, when, so when, you, when you first came to India yeah. uh, and you started working with pastoralists, yeah. what kind of challenges did you oh, face? Oh, the <laughs> challenges were enormous, actually. Yeah, it was... It even, I mean, I must also say I had no background on India at the time. I was just, actually I was set on working in Africa and I had my eyes on there and uh, I thought oh, I'm just going to India and then I'm going to go back to, go to Africa. And so I, had, I didn't know the language, I knew nothing and I was affiliated with the National Research Center on Camel in uh, Bikaner and they... Uh, uh, they thought I would, you know, work in the lab laboratories and so on. And I wanted to meet the camel uh, herders. And that was very difficult. I mean, nobody wanted to take me out there. I never saw camels at the beginning. There were always some walking around on the horizon. And then I was invited by the first veterinary doctor from the Raika community, Dr. Devaram Devasi. He said, I'm posted in Satri. I introduced you to some uh, Raika. And he did. And I mean, on that first day, I, I fell in love with that culture because there was this herd of camels, uh, you know, in that uh, small homestead, they were all resting and there was a little kid of three years, you know, he was walking there through those big animals and I was just totally fascinated. And they then, um, they found out I'm a veterinary doctor and they wanted uh, help from me. Um, and so I, I organized, yeah, and they made me feel really bad. They said, you come here and you take photos, you are no good for us. Uh, and so I felt really bad and I organized uh, some medicines for the camels and this is like how things went, uh, it a, took its course, yeah. <laughs> there's a number of very, very interesting stories uh, Ilse shares in her book, Camel Karma, of, of uh, you know, yeah. We had a question here, yeah. Uh, this ge gentleman with the blue scarf, or a sweater, yeah. Oh, that's Philip. Elsa, yeah, hi. Yeah, um, I'm delighted that you came on an American Institute of Indian yeah. Studies <laughs> fellowship and shows that you don't have to be American to get one. But anyway, um, you, in, in, I, I had no idea of the medicinal benefits of camel milk that you were talking about. How do you get it to people? How, how are you able to market it? I mean, besides cheese, I understand making it into cheese, that's transportable. But the milk itself, are you looking at urban markets? How are you, and can you make chai with it? So, um, so the camel milk, is, it's kind of expensive. Uh, I mean, we're paying a good price to the herders and then we bottle it into like small bottles, 200 ml and we deep freeze them, and then we ship them out in thermocol boxes all over India, basically. And um, that makes it, 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 you know, just the packaging, the labeling, the freezing, the ice, and the thermocol box, that all makes it um, expensive. So it's people who have health problems. No? It's parents of autistic children, people with uh, diabetes, with cancer, they, they buy it. Um, so so that market, actually, it's, it's also not very profitable for us at all. I mean, there are uh, other companies make camel milk powder, and the, then as, as a powder, you can ship it anywhere, deep frozen. I don't think the medicinal effect is as good uh, once it is powder. Uh, but for instance, the cheese, uh, the cheese is, um, I think it concentrates the therapeutic value. And it also has a longer shelf life, and it doesn't we make camel feta, it doesn't need to be refrigerated, uh, doesn't need a cold chain, and we make camel cream cheese, and it's also, yeah, it's not that sensitive. Um, but it's all going on a, you know, on a very small scale, so that's the development here, but globally, I mean, these huge camel units are being set up for 10,000 camels, aiming for 20,000 camels in uh, in the Emirates, all this money, uh, you know, big money from the sheikhs, and all the feed is imported. You know, it's brought over from California, grown with Californian water, the alfalfa goes to the camels in Dubai. It's ecological nightmare. Uh, uh, and China also, chi the Chinese have a big demand for camel milk, uh, and they're also investing heavily now. We, have, we can have one last question. 
hello, we'll save, we'll save the social bit for later. But I have known you for almost 30 plus years since you first got here. Um, sustainability has always been one of your big things. Sustainability not just for the camels, but for the Raika way of life, because they are mutually related. So I'll get to the point very quickly. There's a lot of synergy here. Timmy was talking about what can be done. Nidhi was talking about the same. Uh, can we draw up some kind of list with you, which can help with social popular awareness about both the camel way of life, I mean camels, advantages of camels, uh, and the way of life, including traditionally if there was transhumans, if they were going somewhere, they would, they would stay in somebody's Got area it. and yeah. the manure helps. Got now there's been a lot of conflict with that. It's much more with cattle, but that, that there is actually a benefit in having a moving herd. I, I get your question. Exactly. I get your question. Yeah. And any mm. other points that you want to make that will help the average individual realize okay. the value. Thank you. Okay. My suggestion is that instead of rescuing the camels and putting them in a sanctuary, we need to pay Raika people to take care of the camels. They give us the milk in exchange. We distribute it locally. It will make a huge difference for anemia. You know, all the rural women have, are anemic and many of the children too. So we could go through the public health system. You know, then you avoid all that packaging, you know, transportation. And you help locally. You know, that the local Raika get income. The local people get the health benefits. And the camels are kept in their traditional system. It's the ideal solution. Yes. One last question, anybody? One last question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just, uh, keep it to a line if you have a question. Yeah. I went to the sand dunes in Jaisalmer a week ago, and uh, the camel had a name. Can you hear me? Or we, we have very little time, so if you can yeah. just. The camel had a name, so I most? spoke to the camel, but it didn't react. So do camels, in your experience, react like dogs or cats? Do camels react if you call them a name? They do. It depends how you treat them. You know, you have to build up a, lo you know, a long-term relationship. If they don't know you, no, they're not going to answer. But, if, but that's exactly, again, the fascinating aspect of the Raika culture. They've had this relationship over generations between you know, human families and camel families. So they respond, definitely, camels are extremely intelligent, they learn very fast, they're very curious and, um, and docile in a way. But not, I mean, not just anybody comes. No? I mean, you, you need to build a relationship with them and then they will respond. Okay.